Hello and welcome. On behalf of NIOSH-supported education and research centers throughout the country, we are pleased to present the 2019 Ergonomics Webinar Series, offering free monthly webinars on various topics on human factors and ergonomics. This collaborative effort on behalf of each ERC's continuing education program aspires to provide access to current research supported through NIOSH ERC programs. Thank you for joining us today. Today's webinar, From Practice to Policy, CA's new standard for reducing MSDs among hotel room cleaners, is brought to you by UC Berkeley and Dr. Carissa Harris. A few housekeeping items first. You won't be muted during this presentation. If you would like to ask a question, please enter it into the online chat or Q&A. We'll save time at the end of this presentation to address questions. This webinar will also be recorded and archived for viewing on CUEH Northern California's website, Facebook, and YouTube channel. You can find us at cueh.berkeley.edu. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Carissa Harris. Dr. Harris is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of California at San Francisco and in the School of Public Health at the University of California at Berkeley. She is also the director of the UCSF UCB Ergonomics Research and Graduate Training Program and deputy director of the Northern California Center of Occupational and Environmental Health. Dr. Harris and her team perform research in a variety of areas focused on understanding and preventing work-related injuries and improving human health, performance, productivity, and health. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Michelle, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, I have no disclosures or financial conflicts of interest to disclose, um, but the UC Ergonomics Research and Graduate Training Program is supported by uh, these companies. Today we're going to talk about uh, the various research that contributed to our understanding of musculoskeletal disorders among hotel room cleaners. We're going to discuss why a standard specific to hotel room cleaners was proposed and then adopted. We'll also review the Cal OSHA Musculoskeletal Injury Prevention Program standard and discuss how the standard might be implemented and its impact assessed in the future. As you may know, California has an ergonomic standard. Title VIII, Section 5110 is a standard that stipulates that when at least two employees performing identical tasks have been diagnosed by a physician with repetitive motion injuries within 12 consecutive months, the employer must establish a program that shall evaluate each job, including uh, the exposures that cause the RMIs, control or minimize to the extent feasible those exposures, and provide training to affected employees. So why add more regulation? To understand this, we really need to go back to the beginning of these hotel bed wars. This was started when there was an introduction of luxurious mattresses that hotels were implementing in about 1999. To be competitive, hotels across the country started implementing bigger and more luxurious mattresses that were really uh, coming at a cost to the hotel room cleaners. This and other items led to various strikes uh, supported by the union, Unite Here. Unite Here was instrumental in helping to organize the workers and raise awareness in the sense that these beds were um, creating problems for the hotel room cleaners. But bed making isn't the only task that hotel room cleaners do. They actually have quite a few demanding tasks. They have to push very heavy supply carts, often on thick plush carpets. They clean the bathroom. They have to vacuum as well as dust. They typically clean between 12 to 20 rooms per day. There are repetitive forceful exertions, both with making the bed, cleaning the bathroom, pushing carts. There's repetitive and static postures as well, whether they're stooping forward to clean a mirror or bending forward to fix a pillow. Um, there's many awkward postures in, uh, across all the tasks that they do. And it's been well documented that there was a high incidence and prevalence of symptoms, symptoms that uh, included muscle weakness or excessive fatigue, joint stiffness, reduced flexibility, numbness and tingling. And so this was a concern both to the workers as well as the union. And so they decided to 
um, support some research of Dr. Nicholas Krauss um, to understand it better. The Las Vegas study was a really instrumental study in understanding the extent uh, and severity of musculoskeletal disorders among hotel room cleaners. It was uh, performed by Dr. Kraus and colleagues. It was a study of 941 hotel room cleaners in Las Vegas. And they found that 84% of hotel room cleaners took pain medication within the past four weeks. Older workers were less likely to have pain, indicating a healthy worker survivor effect. And the one month prevalence of pain by region was incredible. For the neck, uh, there was 21% who had moderate pain, 43% who had severe or very severe pain, uh, more than 79% reported moderate or higher pain in the upper back, and again, close over 80% uh, reported pain of the lower back of moderate to very severe. The study identified that the rate of work was quite high. There was an average of 15.3 rooms cleaned per day, and that included over 19 beds per day. 75% agreed that with the statement that their job required working very fast, and 66% of workers reported skipping lunch or breaks or working longer hours to finish rooms. Physical workload was also related to prevalence of severe or very severe pain in a dose response relationship for neck, upper, and lower back. In a further study by Premji and Krauss, published in 2010, they identified that of the 78% uh, of those who had work-related pain in the past 12 months, 47% missed at least one day of work, and there was an average number of days lost of six days. 62% had visited a medical doctor for their pain, and 66% reported taking medication just to get through their workday. Further, 35% reported that at least one injury, 35% identify that they had reported at least one injury to their current employer, and of those, 54% had been denied. 21% reported a workers' compensation claim in the past 12 months, and of those, 35% of the claims have been denied. And 18% had a work-related injury that they did not report. And some of the barriers to reporting included um, misinformation about the symptoms, just thinking that it would get better on its own. They didn't know that they should report it. They felt there were too many steps to report it. They thought that they would get in trouble if, if they were hurt, and there was fear of getting fired. Dr. Krauss and colleagues also looked at the various ergonomic problems that these hotel room cleaners were facing. And there were quite a few of them, everything from the linen cart being too heavy or too difficult to stock. 49% uh, reported the linen cart needing repair. Um, 62% reported that the vacuum cleaner was too heavy and needed repair. 39% reported not having a squeegee for cleaning the bathroom. Uh, and 32% reported not having a mop. And 43% reported having to move furniture. And yet over the years, various tools started to become available. There was fitted sheets for beds, um, mattress lift tools for beds, automated carts, long extension handled tools, and ergonomic handle tools. And yet we weren't seeing a lot of these getting implemented in the workplace. To address this, we did some other smaller laboratory-based studies. In this study, we set up a bed in a motion capture laboratory, and we wanted to quantify the physical exposure of making beds with and without a mattress lift tool and with and without a fitted sheet. You may or may not know that hotels typically use flat sheets as their bottom sheets. You can see that demonstration in the video. What happens is that the hotel room cleaner has to tuck uh, tightly that bottom sheet around the corners so that it stays in place. This really doubles the amount of tucking that they have to do. So we're interested in looking at both of these conditions alone as well as together. We had four conditions total. Uh, condition one being no tool in a flat sheet. Condition two being a tool in a flat sheet. 
condition three being no tool and a fitted sheet, and condition four being both interventions, a tool and the fitted sheet. There were 16 hotel room cleaners from local San Francisco Bay unions, and we used a multifactorial crossover design. You can see that uh, after collecting informed consent and baseline information, uh, they uh, made the beds twice under each condition and rested in between. We collected muscle activity using uh, EMG, motion capture, and uh, video analysis to look at um, uh, kinematics across conditions. Uh, we used the lumbar motion monitor and um, the perceived exertion using the Borg CR10 scale. Really what was most interesting in the results of this study was the reduction in the number of lifts while using the tool and or the fitted sheet. For context, lifting of the corner of the mattress requires about 9.8 kilograms or 22 pounds of force. The number of lifts per bed went from 15 using no tool uh, and a flat sheet to nine to 10 when using either just the tool or the fitted sheet alone, and 7.8 lifts per bed when using both together. This equated to a reduction from 300 lifts per day when using no tool and a standard flat sheet to 182 lifts when using the tool alone, 202 lifts when using the fitted sheet alone, and 156 lifts when using both the tool and the fitted sheet. The interesting thing was that there wasn't a huge change in cycle time. If we were to look at the impact of productivity of using this tool over the, over the course of a shift, that would be about 20 beds, we found that using both the tool and the fitted sheet would only require an extra seven minutes. And these uh, hotel room cleaners really had no experience with this tool. So it's very possible that with practice uh, and time, they would get used to using the tool and there'd be no impact on productivity at all. It's also interesting to note that the fitted sheet alone reduced their um, time requirement of, by 12 minutes. We also assess subjective ratings of participant exertion after each condition. And so you can see these four bars are the four conditions, blue being no tool and flat sheet, um, orange being the tool alone, gray being the fitted sheet alone, and then yellow being both the tool and the, fat, and the fitted sheet. Um, and what you see is that there was a reduction in reported uh, exertion in, in the neck, in the shoulder, in the forearm, hand, wrist, um, back, and legs when using both the tool and the fitted sheet compared to uh, no intervention at all. We also measured heart rate across the conditions. And although there was no difference between the conditions, um, it was interesting to us that they were working at a very high uh, percent of their relative rate um, for all four conditions. So if you see their average um, relative rate, they're pretty close to what we would estimate to be the 33% maximum aerobic capacity that is um, sort of a work shift TLV. And so this was something that was interesting to us. We um, thought that it could be due simply because they were making the bed over and over again without some of their other tasks, but we felt it might be important to look into more in the future. So the conclusions from this study was that um, tool use was consistent in reducing muscle activity. Um, the use of the tool or the fitted sheet reduced the lifts by 37%, and uh, use of the tool and the fitted sheet together reduced the lifts by 48%. The heart rate or workload was high across all the conditions, and the tool and the fitted sheet together reduced um, the perceived exertion, and uh, there was a clear preference across all the hotel room cleaners for both the tool and the fitted sheet. And this was an important piece of identifying a tool that was available out in industry, but yet um, not highly implemented. Because of the findings, uh, the heart rate findings, we were concerned about potential cardiovascular strain among hotel room cleaners. And so we conducted another study to look at um, cardiovascular strain um, we measured them over a 24-hour period. Um, we actually measured them for two work days and two rest days. 
and we were interested in when they woke up, um, when they started work, and when they ended work, and when they went to sleep. We were able to compare pre-work, work to post-work, and then sleep time. We also were interested to look at the first hour of work and how their heart rate was responding, and then the last hour of work. Although we saw a typical increase in the average activity measured as metabolic equivalents and the average percent heart rate reserve, um, there was a mixture of those who surpassed the 33% uh, MACTLV and those who did not. It's also interesting to see that their first hour of work, their heart rate uh, went up. Um, and their last hour of work, you can see that um, it's higher than when they first began. So um, typically, you know, that's, it's normal to go to work if you have a physically demanding job and see an increase in, um, in your heart rate. Uh, however, you do hope that it's maintained fairly consistently if the tasks are consistent and any sort of increasing trend of heart rate over the course of the work shift, um, given no change in tasks, might indicate that there's some um, uh, increased cardiovascular workload to be concerned of. So there were plenty of individuals, if we plot their percent heart rate reserve, which is just a way to normalize um, the increase in heart rate, um, that were below this 33% threshold. Um, but you can see that there were also some individuals that were really very close to this 33%, and there were some that were over it. And so from this study, we were able to identify that the um, average and peak METs for a workday was between 2.57 and 4.88. Some of the workers did exceed that 33% heart rate reserve, again, using that as a proxy for the 33% MAC or maximum aerobic capacity uh, during their workday. And um, during the last hour of work, we also saw uh, some increases in diastolic blood pressure compared to the rest of the day. I think the tricky thing about um, hotel room cleaners work is that they do so many varied tasks, but they do them at a fast pace over and over again. We were asked by um, a group to uh, do a case study on a hotel that had implemented um, new room uh, changes and new carts. And so um, we went down with um, a bunch of equipment and looked at um, comparing new rooms and new carts to the old rooms and the old carts. And we did a really thorough job of an assessment of three different hotel room cleaners, one that was smaller, one that was fairly average stature, and one that was uh, taller. And what we found was really surprising to us. So first of all, um, we used MVTA um, to analyze frame by frame the video that we collected to identify what percent time they spent in different postures of concern. They spent 50 to 60% of their time in forward bend and 70 to 80% of their time in forward reach. We also found that the new rooms and carts required more time, particularly for the checkout rooms. So there was less of an impact in the stayover rooms where guests were um, you know, in a room and staying over that night. Um, there's less cleaning that's involved with stayover rooms, but with checkout rooms, we saw a really large increase in um, the amount of time that it was required. And so we set up three hypothetical examples of someone was cleaning um, 10 checkouts and two stayovers uh, that would impact their shift by 92 minutes. So they would need 92 minutes more time to clean those same rooms. If they had roughly an equal number of, say, six checkout rooms and seven stayover rooms, they would require an extra 33 minutes. And if they had only three checkout rooms and nine stayover rooms, then it would be roughly the same. And what was interesting about this is we found that small changes can really add a lot of extra workload. And so often we see um, changes come and be identified individually and um, yet the, the sum doesn't um, 
you know, it, the, the sum adds up. It, it really increases the workload quite a bit. In this uh, case, there was new plush carpet. There was uh, a new cart that was substantially heavier. Um, and there were glass um, walls in the bathroom. And those were the primary changes. But there were some other ones too. Uh, the towel racks had changed, requiring more uh, folding or precise folding of the towels. And um, there were some changes with some of the lighting and extra beds in the room as well. So you can see here uh, a picture of their old cart, which was um, really, you know, quite small. Um, it had an interesting little latch here where you could just tilt the vacuum on its rear wheels and really push the vacuum up onto the cart. That was different in the new cart. In the new cart, they actually had to lift up the vacuum and really move this linen bag um, to the side to be able to uh, load the vacuum in place. Um, you can see that there was a lot more linen that was stored on the new cart and um, the dirty linen was, was stored as well. Um, and there were, the bins were a lot bigger, both for garbage and linens. So overall, these carts were just a lot bigger and they were meant to store a lot more um, of, of uh, supplies for the various rooms, but um, they were, uh, you know, it came at quite a cost. We um, used a, a force gauge to plot the, the push force that was required over time to initiate motion in these carts. And we compared the new cart with the old carpet to the new cart and the new carpet, to the old cart and the old carpet, and the old cart and the new carpet. And so essentially, this is the workload that, this is the workload on the bottom left that the hotel room cleaners were used to. And yet with the new cart and the new carpet, you can see that not only is the force requirement substantially higher, um, but it was so much higher that it was actually um, a bit harder to, to measure. In addition, we measured 24-hour heart rate uh, on these individuals. Um, and I'm showing you an example of just one of the um, hotel room cleaners and comparing the full 24 hours, roughly, of when they uh, were cleaning the old room and using the old cart, and then roughly a full 24 hours when they were cleaning the new room and using the new cart. And so you can see here that um, they're working extremely hard and harder than we would want to see over an eight-hour shift. However, with the new room and the new cart, um, they were working even harder. And this was getting to be a, a very um, high percent of their heart rate reserve, um, something that we would be concerned with. So from this case study, we identified that um, for this particular hotel, the carts were 50% heavier, required 74% increase in peak push force, and 182% in average, um, increased average sustained push force. Um, the distances were quite long, uh, largely because for every break they needed to return the carts to um, a particular room so they weren't left in the hallway, and that often required uh, longer push distances. This new cart also increased the number of vacuum lifts to 28 times per day, so that was an extra 18.7 pounds of lifts lift force required 28 uh, times per day. The new rooms required more time to clean and the new cart and room required a substantial increase in physiological workload. The percent heart rate reserve increased about 19%. And I think even more concerning was that the recovery time to leisure heart rate after the work shift increased fourfold or to 60 minutes. So when we think about why this extra standard was needed, we have 1.8 million people who work in hotels and about 25% of those are responsible for cleaning hotel rooms. They're primarily women of color and or immigrant status. And they've been shown time and again to be at risk for developing musculoskeletal disorders based on work psychosocial and physical risk factors. Their injury rate is higher than any other type of hotel worker at 7.9 per 100 workers versus 3.2 per 100 workers. And so over a seven year period, there was a collaborative effort 
on the part of advocacy groups, uh, COEH, and uh, academics, and in particular, the huge efforts of the workers in the union to make this uh, problem heard. And um, I was at many of these meetings over the course of the seven years, and it was incredibly moving to hear the stories of uh, individual hotel room cleaners. Um, the lack of support for having tools in the workplace, the lack of training, um, fear of reprisal if they spoke up about um, an ache or pain, um, and just the, the number of people who are living with pain from a day to day, on a day to day basis was really moving. And I think that uh, one of the things that really uh, made this standard come into play was the voices of those workers and the organization of the union. And so although research was really important in, in providing evidence that um, I think legislators needed to be able to implement a standard like this um, without the organization and advocacy of, of workers for themselves and, and by their union, I think this never would have happened. So we call it the MIP. It's Title VIII, uh, Section 3345. Um, it took effect in July 1st of 2018. And I thought I'd take some time to really go through it uh, for two reasons. One, if you're in California and potentially working with this population, it's good that you know what the MIP is all about. Um, and I think if you're not in California, it still is an excellent document that really outlines best practices on how to put together a robust program to prevent musculoskeletal injuries. So the scope and application of this standard, it's intended to control the risk of musculoskeletal injuries and disorders to housekeepers in hotels and other lodging establishments. It defines a housekeeper. It defines a lodging establishment. And it defines musculoskeletal injury and a union representative. And I want to pause here because um, I thought it was really excellent that the union representative was included in this document because they were such an integral part of getting the standard passed. Um, I think uh, of note is uh, one of the one of the better re uh, regulations in the world is in the country of Sweden. And what's interesting about um, Sweden is that their ergonomic regulations actually require union representation. And so um, that seems to have quite a big impact on its effectiveness there. And it's something that we might want to think about in this country. Um, the Cal OSHA standard also defines control measures as effective tools, equipment devices, work practices, administrative controls to correct or minimize workplace hazards that may cause MSDs. It defines worksite evaluation and it's specific that um, it's the identification and evaluation of workplace hazards, including scheduled periodic inspections of the procedures. And so um, I think this is really a, a great description of an evaluation needing to identify housekeeping tasks, processes, operations, and um, with a particular attention to potential causes of MSDs. It also outlines the tasks, so it is um, careful to include things like um, sleeping accommodations, bedrooms, bathrooms, kitchens, living rooms, and balconies. And so that's an, an important point because some rooms take a lot longer to clean given that there are extra amenities in them. Additionally, housekeeping tasks are described. And so it describes everything from sweeping, dusting, scrubbing, mopping, um, polishing, floors, tubs, etc., making beds, vacuuming, um, pushing, pulling carts, um, removing supply linens from, and other supplies in the rooms and uh, collecting and disposing of trash and moving furniture. It includes the name and job title of the person responsible for the MIPP, and uh, it requires a system for ensuring compliance. It also requires a system for communicating on ma matters relating to occupational safety and health, including hazards, injuries, symptoms, without fear of reprisal. And I think that was another important point that this um, without fear of reprisal language was in there. 
there's really five main components of the standard after the definitions. And they include the worksite evaluation, the hazard identification and correction, injury investigation, training, and reporting. It identifies that worksite evaluations need to be, um, are, are triggered um, when new processes, practices, procedures, equipment, or guest room renovations are introduced, particularly that may change or increase housekeeping hazards. So in the case of the case study that I just presented where, um, you know, we were recruited to go down and take measurements to show that a lot of small changes were actually having instrumental large increases in the hotel room cleaners workload. Um, this worksite evaluation would um, provide the um, uh, premise for hotel room cleaners to request this. And I think that's a really important point given that I was told that um, at the, the hotel that we were at, the hotel room cleaners had to ask for about six months to get us um, access to the hotel. Uh, this worksite evaluation section also identifies um, or triggers, uh, is triggered, I should say, when the employer is made of a new or previously unrecognized housekeeping hazard, and it needs to be uh, performed annually for each worksite. And then it lists out all the different items that uh, the worksite evaluation should identify. So it's not limited to this list, but it's careful to um, include this list of um, known hazards that are associated with musculoskeletal disorders. And that includes slips, trips, and falls, prolonged or awkward static postures, extreme reaches or repetitive reaches, lifting or forceful whole, bo whole body or hand exertions, torso bending, twisting, kneeling, squatting, pushing, pulling, falling and striking objects, pressure points, excessive work rate, and inadequate recovery time between housekeeping tasks. In the investigation section, it talks about tasks um, uh, being performed at the time of injury. So this is when there's an MSD that has been um, reported or symptoms have been reported. Um, there's a trigger of an investigation of that. And so, um, you know, what, what needs to happen is that the tasks that were being performed at the time of injury um, are uh, analyzed and whether or not there were any control measures that were available and in use is also assessed. Um, if required tools or other control measures were not used or used inappropriately, um, then there needs to be a determination of why those measures were not used or why were they why they were used incorrectly. And um, it also stipulates that there's input from the injured housekeeper, which again is another best practice in giving the employer that voice to be able to identify um, what the problem might have been. Uh, it also includes language to include the housekeeper's union representative if they have one and the housekeeper's supervisor as to whether any control measure procedure or tool might have prevented that injury. Then for corrective measures, the standard outlines that um, there needs to be an effective means of involving housekeepers and their union representatives in identifying and evaluating possible corrective measures. There needs to be appropriate equipment um, or other corrective measures that are identified. And I think that's really important given that there are identified uh, tools out there that can reduce workload, but again, they're often not uh, utilized at all to the point where some hotel housekeepers are actually cleaning the bathroom floors or mopping uh, with a towel rag instead of a mop. So uh, in the corrective set measures section, it also stipulates that they need to provide and make readily available equipment, protective equipment and tools. And it also stipulates that uh, there's a requirement for inspecting, maintaining, repairing, and replacing tools and equipment, since a lot of the extra workload is actually um, comes from uh, things that have, just haven't been repaired or are broken. Uh, an annual review is required um, at each work site, and um, this uh, is it's outlined that this needs to include active involvement of housekeepers and their union representatives. And so again, it's giving the housekeepers that voice. And there's also um, a requirement 
uh, to uphold the Cal OSHA 300 and 301 logs. Training is outlined in detail, and I think this is a really excellent part of the standard as well. Um, because training is often done over two to five minutes in the beginning of a work shift and is really um, varies in its effectiveness depending on whether a hotel chooses to try to train people in those two to five minutes or actually do a more robust training in the room demonstrating how tools are used. So the training provides feedback on the frequency of the training and it should be triggered when there's a new MIP, uh, new staff or new assignments, and at least annually. It identifies the parameters of the training. For example, that um, the training is performed in a room and with tools. The training should include the signs, symptoms, and risk factors of musculoskeletal disorders and the elements of um, the MIPP. Uh, it should also include a process for reporting symptoms without fear of reprisal. And so there should be training on what that process is and assurance that there will not be some sort of negative outcome for those who um, identify symptoms or injuries. It also trains um, or stipulates that there should be training on hazard identification and control. Uh, it stipulates that there should be opportunity for interaction and Q&A sessions. Um, so that it, there's dialogue between um, the trainers and those being trained. And it outlines specifically that there should be training of supervisors. And I think that's another really strong aspect of the standard. In the records portion, um, the requirement is to, uh, you know, record the steps that are taken to implement and maintain the MIP. Um, that a copy of the MIP and all worksite evaluation records um, should be av made available to the worksite. Um, that all records are made available to the chief of division or designee within 72 hours of request. And of course, the um, occupational injury and illness records are maintained. And so I look at the standard as being a really excellent example of um, the best practices on a work system. So um, if our goal is to have safe and efficient work, then you need to include the employer and address the work environment. You need to include the employees and the union reps. And there needs to be some key components of worksite evaluations, control measures, injury investigation, and all of those need to be included in the training and record keeping. Um, I think that um, there is um, some knowledge of the MIP, obviously, out there among uh, hotels. Um, we're not sure how much knowledge there is among hotel room cleaners, particularly those who are not part of a union. And um, I think that in order for this standard to really be effective, it's going to require a collaborative effort. Um, I know that there are some um, state agencies that are working on getting information out to employers about the MIP and, and best practices and, and how to abide by it. Um, here at the university, we are uh, working on collecting some baseline information to understand uh, how much is known about the MIP and what some of the physical risk factors and, and musculoskeletal experience, disorder experiences uh, today in California's hotels. Um, we're also um, pairing up or teaming up with University of Utah to compare the experience here in California to what their experience there is in Utah, um, using them as a control state essentially over time to see what the impact of um, the standard might be. And um, of course, the unions and the workers um, are going to be the best advocates for the MIP. Um, I think that a standard is really only as good as um, the people who know about it and the people who utilize it to facilitate change. And so, um, you know, some of this change might really come from pressure from workers and their representatives at unions. Um, employers can certainly, um, they, they play a huge role in having this standard have a positive impact. And I think um, the reduction in MSDs and increased productivity um, will be, you know, will be welcomed if it's implemented as written. And of course, advocacy groups have had a longstanding, um, 
interaction in with hotel room cleaners and I think will continue to play a role. So I want to thank Unite Here for um, facilitating subject recruitment and um, all the hotel room cleaners who participated in, in the uh, numerous studies that were presented today. Um, we also want to acknowledge the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention through Southern California NIOSH ERC Pilot Project Research Training Program. Um, we've had two pilot projects funded that, um, actually three, that have been uh, helping to collect data on um, hotel room cleaners. Uh, we also uh, want to thank the STEER Education Program from NIEHS and COEH for their support of some of the work that's presented today. These are a list of references that uh, was referred to during this talk. And I want to thank everyone for their time and attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carissa. Um, we do have some questions rolling in. Um, the first question, in your experience, are these employees generally paid hourly or alternatively paid when they have completed so many rooms? Um, they are typically, um, actually a lot of them are salaried and benefited or hourly, but not necessarily based on how many rooms. So they have productivity requirements that, um, you know, they have to meet to perform their job well, um, but that they're not paid, it's not like a piecemeal pay, right? Not sure what happened to my slides here. Oh, yeah, uh, we're showing a blue on the side. Oh, there it is. Great. <laughs> it's back. Um, another question. Uh, regarding the bed making tool that you showed, I heard complaints from hotel housekeepers that when they use it, it would pull the sheet out when they pulled the tool out from between the box spring and the mattress, thus undoing the tucking. Is there a way to use the tool so that doesn't happen? Yeah, there is. I mean, I, I'm I'm not convinced that, I think the tool is great because it's, it's um, cheap and relatively cheap. I think they're about, I'm not sure if they're 20 or $40, but somewhere in that range. Um, but the issue is that they, they do require training and they require um, practice. So the places that I've seen it implemented the best have been the places that have taken the time to not only train the hotel room cleaners in the room, but they also reduce their productivity requirements over say the course of a week so that there was not that pressure on the hotel room cleaners to um, you know, immediately be able to work as fast as they normally do while they're using this new tool. So I think that if you just give the tool at a morning meeting or you have very limited training with no sort of change in that productivity requirement for a very you know, short time frame, like a week, um, then it's very possible the tool might fail. Um, there are tricks to make sure that it doesn't, you know, the sheets don't come out, um, but you, you have to practice them. Thank you. Um, we have a thanks for the presentation. Um, are you aware of any federal level regulations for hotels and hotel room cleaners? No, I'm not. My understanding is that this is um, the first specific hotel room cleaner um, standard that is related to ergonomics and the reduction of musculoskeletal disorders. Thank you. Is there any kind of maximum bed or room allowance under the standard? And how does the employer schedule shifts? Um, that's a great question. The shifts do change. Most of the shifts, um, you know, mo most workers are sometime between 7 and 8 a.m. is when they start, and then they finish anywhere between 3 and 5 p.m. Um, but there are some shifts that are in the afternoon, particularly for some of the more luxurious hotels that might do like a turn down, sort of turn down your sheets and put a chocolate on the bed kind of a thing. Um, so, but, but primarily most of them that are doing this kind of work are during the day. Great. Was there another part of that question? Um, I think you covered it. Okay. Um, and thank you to everyone for all of these great questions. I'm glad we have a lot of time to go through them all. <laughs> great discussion here. Um, we have another question. Did you find the general use of the long-handed tools was effective and did it increase risk? For example, cleaning the bathrooms, glass walls, mirrors? Yeah, I actually... Um, I think it really depends on the the layout. 
So um, I think long-handed mops are critical. Um, I haven't really seen anyone use a towel in a way that would, you know, make that better than a, a, a standard mop. Um, and so I think getting people off their knees and um, using a long-handed mop handled tool for mopping is, is really important. Um, in the bathroom, I definitely think that the longer handled squeegees are good because it does help reduce some of the, the reaching that is required. Um, however, if it's a really cramped shower or bath, um, then I think it can create issues. So um, I think it's best to watch someone utilize it and figure out what the right size extended extension of the handle is. Um, and ideally, if you have adjustability and how long that adjustable handle is, I think that would, um, would be best. Thank you. Uh, we also have a comment from one of our attendees, Ira Janowitz. He did a study on the use of long handled tools for shower cleaning and is happy to send it to anyone who might be interested. Um, so if you need his contact information, <laughs> you can reach out to us and, and we'll be sure to share it with you. <laughs> Great, thanks, Ira. <laughs> um, another question, does this standard apply to hospital workers who clean patient rooms? No, I don't believe it does. Um, I actually listed, um, let's see if I can get to it. Um, actually listed that here um, as far as who it applies to. And it really does, um, it really is more specific to your standard hotels, B&Bs, motels, et cetera. Um, but that is a good question. And I think there's a lot that we actually um, could think about applying to janitors in general. So not just, um, you know, in, in hotels, but, um, you know, other, other workers who have similar risks. Um, so here we go. We have housekeeping tasks and it includes housekeepers, guest room attendants, room cleaners, maids, and house persons. Um, but there's really no um, application to um, hospital workers. I think that the risks are different enough in hospitals that um, it would warrant um, maybe a different approach. Thank you. Um, and for people who are asking about copies for the slides, this presentation has been recorded. We're going to be hosting this on our website, coeh.berkeley.edu. It'll also be on our YouTube page. Um, and if you want a copy of the actual slides, you can send an email to coehce at berkeley.edu, and we'll be happy to send you a PDF of those. Again, that's coehce at berkeley.edu. Um, we do have some other questions here about the content. Um, are you aware of any complaints filed or any enforcement activity by Cal OSHA based on this new standard? You know, I'm not, but I see that Garrett Brown is on the call, so maybe he can type something in if he, if he knows. Um, I, I'm not aware of any um, recent complaints that have been triggered based on the standard. Great, thank you. Um, we have another um, it's comment mixed in with a question. Excellent presentation, very interesting results. Karen Messing has studied hotel workers and MSDs in the past. This study elaborates upon some of the issues she identified. The tool certainly seems to be effective when the worker is properly trained. Does worker proficiency improve fairly quickly over time? Um, I, in my experience, yes. So I haven't. Um, you know, we haven't actually done a study to quantify that, um, but I've done quite a bit of work um, in the past training on those tools and, and certainly um, the way that they use it and, um, you know, their efficiency in using new tools increases with more practice. Um, we do have a comment from uh, Garrett. A key reason for why another regulation was needed in California is that Section 5110 had several safe harbor clauses written into it, so employers were not required to do anything if they felt it was not feasible or if Cal OSHA could not show that measures were substantially certain to work and if they did not require unreasonable costs. Um, he was asking also if there are any safe harbor aspects to the new regulation. Oh, um, you know, that's a great question. Um, and I think it's going to be interesting to see 
um, how it gets implemented. I, I would say the language is pretty strong, but there are some parts where maybe um, some of us were hoping it would be stronger. Um, and so I think we'll have to see um, how, how it plays out. Great. Um, and we also have another comment related to the, ins the earlier question about Cal OSHA. Um, I believe there have been Cal OSHA inspections under the new standard that have happened in Los Angeles. Um, details will be forthcoming, not available at this time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Thank you for whoever chimed in on that. <laughs> um, another question about, have you seen any hotels using self-propelled carts? And if so, how did they work out? Yeah, they were great. Um, you know, the they obviously require uh, a lot less work on the hotel room cleaners part. Um, and so I, I don't think I've ever heard of a hotel room cleaner complain of a mechanized cart. Um, some of the concerns that I hear from hotels is that um, it can damage or scuff walls. So I think um, there needs to, again, be training on how to drive the carts and utilize them. And I'm sure there are some different um, considerations that need to be made when purchasing the right cart. Um, and uh, probably some, some different things that could be done in, uh, you know, on the walls themselves to kind of protect against any sort of damage if the cart um, erroneously gets run into the wall. Great, thank you. Um, we also had a request to uh, explain safe harbor. Oh, well, we'll see if uh, Garrett can chime in on the safe harbor, but my understanding <laughs> was that um, it's, you know, it, it's basically sort of a um, get out of jail free card, um, meaning it just gives a, gives the um, employer an out. And so um, when there's language that, um, you know, allows the employer to, it, it, it makes it a judgment call as to whether something's feasible, then um, it, it gives the employer out to say, sorry, this is just too expensive or it's unfeasible to do this. Um, and so that's what I think he means by the safe harbor. Great, thank you. Um, have you come across or do you know of any recommendations for making a bed on a side that's up against a wall? Similarly, tucking in sheets where the bed is up against nightstands. Um, well, there's a lot of new tools that are coming out for bed making. Um, and I'm less familiar from a research perspective on how well they work. Um, I've seen spring-loaded mechanisms that you put underneath the corners of the bed. Um, so, um, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure how they work in those instances. What we typically re um, suggest is that they just move the bed a, a, a particular distance from the wall so that people can actually get to the, the corner of the bed without having some sort of awkward position. And as far as um, the nightstands go, I think what's really important is to have enough space and to make better purchasing decisions such that um, you know the hotel stand doesn't um, impede the person, the hotel room cleaner from getting to those corners. So it, it really does require um, forethought uh, from the employer's standpoint. And again, I think, you know, if they, if the hotels um, could engage either ergonomists and or uh, workers and or their union reps in some of those decisions, it would be extremely helpful. Great, thank you. Um, we also have a comment regarding some tucking tools. There are some new tools on the market, um, for example, ErgoTuck, um, which is done by CIE. So there are other tools available. Um, and then we have a clarification question. Um, when you did the study with the tool and the fitted sheet, was the tool that you're referencing the tucking tool? Um, yes, so um, we didn't, uh, typically what they did is in the process that we taught them because um, they did have a little bit of practice time was um, they had one tool which was that blue wedge that you saw and um, we made suggestions as to sort of where they put the tool so that they could tuck the sheets um, typically they would put the tool in place leave it in place and then tuck with their hands but a lot of them would go back and use it to touch up the tucking sort of to you know, when, once the sheets and the comforter and all were primarily tucked, then um, they would go back and sort of make it look nice um, with the tool. So the, the initial tucks were not using the tool and the final tucks were, if that helps. 
Great. And we have another question um, kind of furthering on the fitted sheets. Um, often as they shrink, more force is needed on the hands and fingers to fit them on the mattress. Is that something you encountered or do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I have seen that before. So if, again, the, um, if either they shrink or um, there's a poor purchasing decision, then it can be worse than a flat sheet. And um, I think that's a really important distinction to make. So I'm glad someone brought that up. Um, however, if it's, you know, the right size and um, they're sort of pre-shrunk, uh, then, you know, they're, they're, you know, preferred in a lot of ways, um, particularly because it reduces so many of the lifts and tucks. Um, I have heard that there's a new sheet that has some sort of a drawstring approach to it. Um, I, I, I haven't heard as to, you know, how that is working out. Um, but I, again, I've seen hotels implement fitted sheets just fine um, and, uh, you know, be able to use them without having that shrinkage problem, which I think is more of a, of a quality of sheet issue. Thank you. Um, we also have a confirmation on Safe Harbor. Carissa is right on. Weasel words and get out of jail free, <laughs> as you should say. <laughs> Um, we have a couple other questions that are related to the um, employment type work that people who are involved in this, are they contract workers or employed directly by the hotel? Do you often see full-time or part-time workers in this field? Yeah, that's a great question. Most of, um, most of what I've seen is that they're employed by the hotel um, and they're typically covered, you know, under the workers' compensation as regular employees. Um, I have not seen um, hotels go to that model where they essentially are hiring contractors and then there's some other entity that is essentially, you know, employing people um, to hotels as contractors. So um, thankfully that I, I haven't seen that to be the case. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and are there any recommended number of beds or number of rooms per day per housekeeper? You know, there's, there's just not. I do wish that we could do a study on um, the right mix of checkouts and stayovers um, because I think there's just so many components to it. Um, in reality, it's going to vary a lot across hotels because um, they're, you know, depending on the specific hotel. So for example, very nice hotels will have um, a lot of um, extras, I guess I would say, that, that have to get done. And there's um, things have to get done to a certain standard quality that take longer. Um, with lower scale hotels, um, they're much more lenient. And um, a lot of times they, you know, can clean some more rooms because um, the rooms take a little bit less time to clean. I think the biggest thing that is interesting, though, is really the ratio of, of checkout to stay over, regardless of the, the quality or scale of the hotel and what their individual requirements are. Um, and I, I don't see a lot of that. I, I, you know, yes, there's um, hotels who will drop a credit um, if so many checkout rooms are assigned, but I still think that the number of checkout rooms that can be assigned to a hotel housekeeper is really large and very problematic. And I think that that's something that, that should be looked at in this whole question um, of work rate. Excellent. Again, thank you to all our attendees. We have a great number of questions here. We have one left, and then we'll let, let everyone move on to get their lunch or whatever else they might be doing. Um, was there criteria to understand the many denials of claims? There may have been other circumstances, not just the reporting of MSDs, as it's very difficult to successfully deny claims. You know, I can't give more information about that. Um, that would be a better question for Dr. Kraus, but this was done in Nevada. So the, the data that I um, presented from Dr. Krause's studies was, was in Nevada, which I do believe has maybe some, some different um, workers' comp experiences as far as claim rate acceptances and denials. 
Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. A special thank you to our presenter for sharing your knowledge with us. Our next NIOSH ERC webinar will be on vehicle seat design, whole body vibration, and low back pain. That'll take place on Wednesday, April 17th with Dr. Pete Johnson in the University of Washington. Thank you so much for everyone who joined us today, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week.